keeping up with them. They're all up now. Okay. So we we ended on <coughs> Wednesday talking about the parts of the chloroplast. <laughs> Membrane. Um, yeah, so the outer membrane, inner membrane, inner membrane space. They're kind of like, not like the mitochondria, but kind of like the mitochondria. We have the thylakoids, just as kind of like a really quick recap. Thi thylakoid membranes in here, uh, that has a lot of the photosynthetic electron transport chain components in that. And inside here is the thylakoid lumen. We have some more of the electron uh, transport chain components in there. And those are the major parts I'm just going to recap real fast. So let's get into the part past that. Here, we have photosynthetic pigments. These are embedded in some of the electron transfer chain components in the thylakoid lumen. This makes them look green. And these are going to be the things that are initially uh, capturing the energy from light and getting it into our electron transfer chain. These things include things like chlorophylls and carotenoids. There's a few other pigments in there. Chlorophylls tend to be green and carotenoids tend to be oranges and reds and then there's other random pigments in there as well. Um, sometimes anthocyanin and sometimes a few other random things depending on what plant you're, you're looking at. Yeah. So, um, so let's, let's begin off with the, kind of the big overview of what's happening with the electron transfer in, in photosynthesis. We have those pigments they are going to absorb light energy and inside that pigment an electron is going to become excited is going to become excited by light I get excited by light it's a fun thing to do I see light and I get excited I don't know why that I said that at all um, the electron then is boosted to a higher um, electron orbital or a higher energy state and then something needs to happen and so is really unstable. It's only going to stay there for about a billionth of a second. And then something needs to happen. So we've added energy to this electron. It can't just hold it indefinitely. And so it's going to need to do something with that. Have you ever wanted to drink something out of a to-go mug and not been quite lined up with your, your mouth with the hole and it pours down your cheek? Yeah. Okay, I'm not the only person that does dumb things like that. Thank you. Someone said yep up there. Yeah, I was like not looking and like... Uh, I just barely caught myself from doing that right now. If you learn anything from cell biology, line up your cup correctly. Okay. So something must happen. There's a couple different things that can happen. Uh, the first thing that can happen is fluorescence. We can just release the energy again as light. Like it comes in as light, it gets absorbed. <laughs> I was really enjoying the breeze. about this is that the light that actually gets emitted is different than the light that was absorbed. And so in fluorescence, essentially just kind of a brief recap, some, some molecules go into absorb light, it causes some electrons to jump up the, to a higher orbital, and then it jumps back down and re-releases that energy as light. In the case of fluorescence, the wavelength of light that is going out is different than the wavelength of light that came in because you've lost some energy in, the, in that process. So you have a slightly different wavelength that's going back out. Um, and this is actually a really interesting thing with these pigments. This is actually a really big way in which we detect chlorophyll and things. Is we use the fluorescence. We can like shine it with a certain wavelength of light and know that chlorophyll fluoresces at some certain wavelength. And we can measure chlorophyll that way in, in <laughs> a lot of things we need to measure chlorophyll. In fact, we can measure chlorophyll this way 
using the sun and a satellite in the sky. And the satellite way up in the sky can just measure chlorophyll fluorescence. And this is one of the big ways that we can measure, like, how many plants are on the ground from a satellite way up. We're going to measure the fluorescence. So, um, and there's specific fluorescence of chlorophyll. So, but this, this is not what the plant wants to happen. This is going to happen with some amount of the, uh, the energy that's absorbed by chlorophyll, but this isn't necessarily the ideal scenario. Another thing that you could do is you could have electron transfer. An electron can be transferred to another molecule. So that, that, that electron is really energized, and it's like, how could you do? No, you take it. And it could transfer it to another molecule. This is a good thing. You might think, hey, we can kick off an electron transport chain that way. And you'll be right. The other thing that can happen is that the electron can pop up to a higher orbital, then pop down to a lower, lower orbital, and just transfer the energy along. This would go on to a neighboring pigment and essentially excite an electron in that pigment. And so it can also just pass the energy along without passing the electron along. along. Oh That's another thing that can happen. Okay. So now that we've kind of covered that, let's begin to talk about some of the specific components of a photosynthesis electron transport chain. And one of the most important of these electron transport chain components is going to be, or known as the photosystems. The photosystems are components that are going to have uh, chlorophyll as part of them, and that is going to be a part of a, of a part of the molecule called the light harvesting complex. And then we also have a photosystem reaction center. The photosystem reaction center is essentially taking now the energy that has been gathered by the light harvesting complex and transferring it into some electrons that we can then pass on to a future part of the electron transport chain. So the photosystems are going to be composed of these two parts, a light harvesting complex and a photosystem reaction center. And the very first one, very intuitively named Photosystem 2. And it has its own light harvesting complex that we're going to talk about here in a second. So if we look at diagram here, this is our diagram of the uh, photosynthesis electron transport chain. Here we have uh, Photosystem 2 represented here. And we have a lightning bolt, which I was making this, and I was like, well, I don't know exactly how to represent this, so light is going to be re represented by a lightning bolt. It makes sense, right? Kind of like light? Okay, good. Lightning bolt means light. <laughs> so we have light that is interacting with photosystem 2. And photosystem 2 actually contains a lot of individual pigment molecules in its light harvesting complex, anywhere between 2 to 500 pigments. And they're going to be attached to, depending on the, uh, the actual specific plant or algae uh, photosystem, is going to be attached to anywhere between 3 to 8 polypeptides. So we have these pigments that are then attached onto uh, polypeptides, making up the light harvesting complex. Finally, the light harvesting complex, or after light, the light harvesting complex harvests essentially the light. In other words, the light will interact with some of these pigments, excite some of those, those molecules. The energy from that light is then going to be transferred to the photosystem 2 reaction center. And it's then this reaction center that transfers electrons onto the next system, or onto the next electron transport chain. Okay. 
So let's take a brief look at how essentially this works. Um, what you're looking at here is, is like a model, like a little makeup of a little diagram of photosystem one. All these green disks are representing chlorophyll molecules, very specific chlorophyll mo molecules. We have another type of chlorophyll here called P680, and then here's the primary uh, electron acceptor here. These two components right here are part of the reaction center. All of this through here is part of the light <coughs> harvesting complex. What's going to happen is one of these chlorophyll molecules is going to interact with light and it's going to excite the electrons. What happens then is that energy just keeps getting passed between chlorophyll molecules and the light harvesting center. It actually is somewhat randomly then just bouncing around those chlorophyll pigments. It's not really specific where it's going. But it just bounces around them until finally that energy hops to, and it makes that sound too hops onto the P60. The P60 then actually donates electrons to a pair of its electrons to the primary electron acceptor portion of the reaction center, which then can pass them on to another electron transfer chain component. So you have energy that's being passed among the chlorophyll molecules until eventually it lands on, that energy lands onto the P680, which is a specific a different kind of uh, chlorophyll. And specifically, it's called P680 because 680, 680 nanometers is the wavelength at which it maximally absorbs light. And then that pops onto, that will donate electrons. So that's why this arrow is yellow because it's not energy being passed on, it's actually a pair of electrons is being passed on to the primary electron acceptor portion of the reaction center, which then can pass it on from there. And so that's how we get um, energy captured <coughs> by the chlorophyll and actually how it gets converted into electrons that are going to be moving on. So the reaction center then is going, is actually a fairly big chunk. I'm just making a little box in there, but it has 20 individual polypeptides that are part of the reaction center and most of it or all of those are coming from chloroplast DNA. <coughs> As we just saw, this also contains a chlorophyll A molecule called P680, which again is different than the remainder of the chlorophyll in that when it gets the energy, instead of essentially just passing on the energy, it is going to then instead pass on a pair of electrons to the next component, the reaction center. And we are therefore then just energy from the light harvesting complex gets transferred to the P680. <coughs> the P680, that energy is going to raise an electron to a higher orbital in uh, the P680, which then raises it, uh, a pair of electrons to a higher um, uh, orbital in the reaction center, or the primary uh, electron acceptor in the reaction center. And then that those electrons are going to be transferred to plastoquinone. Plastoquinone is the next electron transport chain element right after photosystem <laughs> two. Okay, plastoquinone. Now that that name is up there, Before we move on, well, I'll come back to that one, just a second. Actually, let me see what I have up here. Well, I destroyed the mystery. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will destroy the mystery. So I'm just going to talk about plastoquinone for a second, then we'll leave plastoquinone for a minute. Um, <coughs> Does this sound like, does this have a name that's similar to anything that we saw in, in the mitochondrial electron transfer chain? What's that? Yeah, ubiquinone. So, can anyone guess the nature, anything about the nature of plastoquinone from ubiquinone? What's that? 
is a lot of it, but there's, it, it goes deeper than that. Yeah. Is it like a lipid? It is a lipid. So plasquinone is going to be a lipid. It's going to be very mobile and moving through the uh, the thylakoid membrane with with relative ease, transferring electrons along. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Okay. So one more one one more thing. So just just as just as a recap here, light attacks not attacks really. Um, light uh, interacts with the chlorophyll molecule, which then raises electrons to a higher orbital. Those get passed along. That energy, the specific energy, gets passed along to adjacent chlorophylls, each raising electrons, and then those will crash back down, transferring the energy to adjacent ones till eventually it interacts with the P680. Then the P680 actually transfers electrons to the primary electron acceptor. This is all part of the reaction center of photosystem two, and that passes on electrons to plasticoenone. However, by the time we're all done with this, our poor chlorophyll, the P680, is missing electrons. And we have to replace those. This is going to be done by a specific part of photosystem one that is known as the oxygen evolving center, or the oxygen evolving protein, I'll say. This is three polypeptides from nuclear DNA. And it's going to contain actually quite a few different things that are kind of unusual for a protein. It's going to contain uh, manganese, chlorine, calcium. And what it does is it splits water, the hydrogen plus oxygen, and transfers the electrons to P680. Evolving there regenerates those electrons that were lost by P680 by splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen, or oxygen and a proton, and passes those on to P680 to regenerate the electrons that were <coughs> <it> lost <coughs> by passing on its electrons to the primary electron acceptor and then on to plasma chlorine. So again, looking at our diagram, that is right here, the oxygen evolving uh, proteins right here, alpha system two, we have water, and this gets, it's really hard to see, but this is an oxygen right here, and then we have a proton. Here's an interesting thing. Again, just like before, we are trying to build up a high level of protons in here, we're going to use that proton gradient. So actually what we're doing in the big scheme of things here is using that proton gradient to make ATP through ATP synthase. That's that, I mean, that big picture hasn't changed. But one of the things that has changed is we're not just pumping them, we also essentially produce them. One of the places that we're getting one of those protons is to reduce it through this process right here. And so actually, photosystem 2 does not actually pump protons, but it does produce two protons. Every time that we do this, we're going to produce two protons by splitting water into a couple protons plus an oxygen and help using those protons to build up the proton concentration or decrease the pH on inside the thylakoid lumen. And we can then use those to run our ATP synthase down, down the road. And so in this way, this is, this is a kind of different way that we can end up getting that. Now another funny thing though, I mean not funny, ha ha ha, very funny. Um, this is where you get photosynthesis producing oxygen. This is why photosynthesis produces oxygen, is because you actually take this and that then leaves the plant overall. Net leaves the plant. Some of this will actually get used for respiration, but the majority of it then leaves the plant. So this is why plants produce oxygen. <coughs> okay. So, we also are passing a proton, or excuse me, electrons onto plastoquinone. And like you discovered already, plastoquinone is a lipid. It's this highly mobile lipid that is going to take two electrons from both system two and pass them on. 
Okay, yeah. <coughs> and so, plasma node is on the stromal side of the membrane. So this is not on the phylocoid lumen, this is on the outside. So again, uh, I show it just right here in the middle, but really it's sitting here on the stromal side of the membrane on this side, not on the, uh, the thylakoid side, but on the stromal side. And it's, again, because it's a lipid, it's really mobile. And the thylakoid lumen tends to be a fairly fluid, or excuse me, the thylakoid membrane tends to be a pretty fluid membrane anyways. So plasoquinone can move very rapidly shuttling electrons through the thylakoid membrane passing them on to the next component. That next component being cytochrome B6F, or the cytochrome B6F complex. This is actually really similar to the cytochrome BC1 complex that we saw in the mitochondrial electron transport chain is doing a very similar thing. Again, we're sitting right here. So B6F is going to take electrons from plasmoquinone, toss them off to plasmocyanin. <coughs> and it has four polypeptide chains. One of them is from nuclear DNA. Three of them are from the chloroplast DNA. So the majority of this is made is natively by the chloroplast, but not all of it. Because we have is a cytochrome. Wow, did I just do that wrong every? Oh boy, this is really okay. That's cytochrome, not cytochrome. Oh man, I misspelled cytochrome. Just never mind, never mind. <coughs> I'm gonna feel really weird about this until I fix that. Because that, that looks so bad. I mean, the reality of things is probably not that bad. But, oh boy, it's on so many slides because I just copied, like, once I get the heading up there, I probably can, but I'm done now, so. I mean, it's like seven or so. I mean, not not that many. Okay, there we go. Okay, so like the other cytochromes that we've seen, and because it has two layers, we have two heme groups. Both of them contain an iron. That's going to allow it to pick up and conduct these electrons, but also has um, another polypeptide that has an iron sulfide bond in it, like another iron bound to a sulfur. As it does this, it's going to then pump protons across the membrane. So each electron is going to lead to two protons being pumped from the stroma to the lumen. 
two for every uh, electron this gets passed on, and then it passes on those electrons to plasticyanin. Plasticyanin, like um, saccharin B, it can only transfer one electron at a time. So it's picking up one electron and passing, passing that on to the next component along the electron transfer chain here. So that's what we have here, his plasticyanin. It takes it from saccharone B6F, passes one electron at a time to photosystem 1. And because we have cyanin, this kind of indicates that we are a copper-containing protein here. And the copper changes its oxidation state. It's actually, the copper is actually what's picking up the electron. It's copper 3 plus. It picks up an electron and then it becomes copper 2 plus. Carries it along, dumps it off, becomes copper 3 plus again after it, it uh, loses that electron. And it's actually not bound in the membrane. Like many of the other electron transfer chain uh, components, is not bound in the membrane. In fact, it's actually just free in the thylakoid lumen. But there's enough of it that's still interacting with enough of the, the electron uh, transport chain components that it still does a good job of transport. And it's going to take one electron from the saccharone B6F and it transfers it to the photosystem 1 reaction center. So it's not delivering it necessarily to a light harvesting complex or anything, it's delivering it directly to the light or the reaction center of photosystem 1. Because it's not bound in the membrane, because it's not actually sitting in the membrane somewhere, it actually makes this very mobile as well. It, it can fairly rapidly shuttle electrons from one component to the next because it's not bound in the membrane. So, which then brings us to photosystem one. Just as an aside, <laughs> we, we call it photosystem one because it, we discovered it first and we're like, yeah, it's the first one. Um, not really the first one in the chain of events, but okay, whatever. We discovered it first. It's usually you go back and you're like, okay, I know we've been calling it this forever, but we're just going to reverse the names. Now that we know more, I don't know. Maybe, maybe even if you're like queasy about the numbers, maybe call them A and B. Like we can't call it the thing that we called this other one because then all the literature would be so so confused. We'll call it A and B instead. So it's kind of well. <laughs> I was saying hypothetically that would be the case in the perfect world I invented, but. This is not the perfect world I invented. Yeah, it is, it is the perfect world someone else invented. Or it's not. Anyhow. <laughs> so, here we go. Uh, photosystem 2, here. We're going to get light. Because it's still a photosystem, we're still going to get light um, interacting with it. So, just like the other photosystems, we have both a light harvesting complex and a reaction center. Both of those are going to be a part of this. However, and yeah, again, uh, a reaction center it has 11 polypeptides, six from the nuclear DNA, five from the chloroplast DNA. So this is interesting, unlike the previous one that we talked about that's almost exclusively, or ex exclusively from, from the chloroplast DNA. So in this case, we're doing something slightly differently. <laughs> 
reaction center. Of course, this is one uh, reaction center. We have another chlorophyll, which is P70 or P700 instead of uh, P680. And similar to what we saw before, we're going to get light energy. It's going to cause an electron to reach a higher orbital in the light harvesting complex in one of the chloroplasts, or excuse me, one of the chlorophyll molecules. It's going to pass it along until it reaches the P700. But then the big difference here is instead of raising, like donating to its own electrons, those electrons that has been passed on to it is going to raise, is going to pass those <laughs> electrons on. Those electrons aren't going to get replaced by water at this point. It's going to get replaced by the electrons that have been passed down the electron transport chain. So the difference here is we're not getting electrons to replace those electrons from the actual water that we're splitting, but we're actually getting them from the electrons that have been passed down. Now that being said, it's not necessarily a one for one is not necessarily that you can track that individual electron that that then replaces. But the way that you can think of it is in here, instead of actually generating new electrons, we're essentially boosting the electrons that were being passed along. You can kind of divorce your mind from the idea that it's actually the individual electrons being passed on, because actually in no electron transport chains is necessarily those individual electrons that you get passed on all the way down. Um, essentially, we are giving the electrons an energy boost at this point. Yes? So why is this? Like, why, why put a power system in an electron transport chain and, and have it consume electrons from the chain and boost up again so it can go for longer? Yeah. Yeah, we have more things that we want to do with it. So essentially, we have lost enough energy in those electrons by this point that we need more energy. So it needs to get back up again to a higher energy state so that we can do some more things. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a convenient way of thinking about it, but like with everything in biology, it's not quite that simple, but it's a useful way to think about it. Well, And this is going to pass it on to the next electron chain component, which is ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin then is going to only though receive one electron at a time. It can only transport one single one at a time. And it's actually physically bound to photosystem one. So we have a component here, ferrodoxin is right here. It's actually physically bound to photosystem one. It's on the, and it's bound on the stromal side of photosystem one. So it's not on the lumen side, it's on the stromal side. Now, kind of as you can imagine from the name, it has an iron bound to it. It's bound to a, a sulfur. I think on cysteine, but I do not remember specifically. Because it actually turns out that photosystem one is pretty mobile. Ferrodoxin as well, that's bound to is also mobile, very mobile. It's able to move through the membrane as well. It then interacts and passes an electron on to NADP reductase. 
then brings us to NADP reductase, which um, is right here. Uh, I'm showing it as being bound here, but it's actually not bound. It's somewhat, somewhat free here. It's just here interacting. And so the electron transferred to NADP is, well, the electron that it gets is then given to NADP plus, which in this system is the final electron acceptor in this particular electron transfer chain, not oxygen. And we are going to form NADP plus. It's going to take two electrons per NADP. Uh, we're excuse me. We're going to form NADPH. Two electrons per NADPH. Hold on a second. I'm not sure if it's using one to power and one. Hold on a second. Let me just. No. Yeah. Yes, it actually uses, it takes two electrons. It actually accepts two electrons. Yeah. 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 So NADP plus, H plus, two electrons. Okay, so let's, let's just, like, think about this just for a second. In the mitochondria, you have a molecule similar to NADP+. Really, the only difference between NADH, excuse me, the only difference between NADH and NADPH is a phosphate group, an additional phosphate group on the adenine. It's really the only difference. But they're, they're, they carry two electrons. In that case, in the mitochondrial, you take two electrons that have been stored in your nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide type molecule and you pass them along an electron transport chain until you get pumping protons using their energy until you get to the end at which you pass it off to oxygen to form water. In this case, we're essentially running the exact opposite. We're using light to energize the electrons, but the ultimate source of those electrons is water because we keep having to regenerate those electrons uh, from splitting water and we're getting oxygen out and then we run it the other direction again pumping protons until we form finally a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide that accepts those electrons at the very end so essentially these are in the grand scheme of things the same thing but they're running in two opposite directions one of them, we start with this dinucleotide <coughs> and we run through to accepting to oxygen. In the other case, we start with oxygen being split off of water and run it the other way, where we're essentially taking electrons from oxygen and running it the other way. Now we can get energy out of both of these because essentially the, the source of the energy is different. Normally you can't run a, run a reaction both ways and get energy out of it both ways. That, that just doesn't work. That, violate thermodynamics. If you could do that, you could like have free energy forever. Like, we're going to run the reaction this way and get energy. We're going to reverse it and run it that way and get energy. And, like, I had to walk uphill and snow both ways to get to school. And I had the energy for it all. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, if you could do that, you'd be a crotchy old man. But you're not. And so you can't do that. In this case, you're just running it both ways. And in one case, we're getting the energy from light to run it that way. In the other case, we're getting energy from the bonds in macromolecules that we're oxidizing and to run it the other way. So we're getting the energy from two different places, but it's two, like essentially the same, schematically, it's the same thing running in two different directions. Okay. Any questions on, on the electron transport chain part? Yes, Ricky. What's that? Well, it's only a single plus, isn't it? No, you have NAD. 
plus, you have two pluses. Because there's one plus on here, there's one plus on the proton that you're adding. Yeah. And so then you have a pair of electrons. And does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So that gets us to a state where we have a bunch of protons on the platinum coin lumen side, a lot less on the stromal side, which means that we can run an ATP synthase like we did before. In this case, it's very similar to the ATP synthase that we saw before in uh, electron transfer chain, the normal electron transfer chain. So I am actually not going to spend a ton of time belaboring all of this. We have a CF1, C, or CF0, CF1, this is like chloroplast, C is the same for chloroplast in each of these cases. CF0, CF1, ATP synthase. We're sitting here at the very end of this uh, electron transport chain. We're using these protons that we've built up a concentration with on this side to pump them through, or not pump them, excuse me, but just allow them to go down their electrochemical gradient and form ATP. For every electron pair that we got, we got two protons at the oxygen evolving center. Both of those came from water. And then we got four protons at the B6F. So per, per pair, we're actually getting six protons. You might think to yourself, hey, that's not as good as a mitochondrial electron transfer chain. You're like, yes, but we did it from light. Like basically did it for free. We could just like this light that's all around. We could just pump things across. <coughs> and it's fun in the So we have a pH gradient that we have. It's eight in the stroma, and it's actually five in the thylakoid lumen. Yes. Oxygen evolving center. That is, if we go back to, that's on photosystem <laughs> one. Here, where we take water and we split it and we get two protons. So we have two protons up there and an oxygen. Yeah, photosystem two. I said photosystem one, didn't I? See, they confuse me. That's not okay. So eight in the stroma is actually as, as low as five in the thylakoid lumen. We actually get a pretty steep um, difference. So we actually have a thousand-fold difference in proton gradient and proton concentration across the thylakoid membrane. That actually turns out we have here 200 millivolts. This is all due to the pH gradient, or essentially the, the proton concentration gradient across there. It turns out that there's not an electrical gradient across this membrane because of other ions that are involved in, in uh, that are present on both sides. So all we have is the proton concentration gradient, and we give out 200 millivolts of a proton motive force across there. Then we have either two point four or five protons pass across the ATP synthase per ATP. And a mean of four point six, five seven. This this is dependent on what kind of ATP synthase you're using. <coughs> Two, four or five. 
have 4.67 pass through the ATP assemblies for ATP, excuse me. And this whole process is known as photophosphorylation. In, in contrast to oxidative phosphorylation that we saw in the mitochondria. sunshine while it lasts because, you know, November, the college place is not always sunny. It's not even often sunny. It's not even most of the time sunny. Enjoy it.